Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Andy, for inviting me, and thanks to the EXPECT team for organizing this workshop. So, um, I want to use the opportunity to advertise this website. Um, here you find an uh, edited collection of open access papers on philosophy and predictive processing. The authors include Andy Clark, Michael Anderson, and uh, Jakobovi, and many other authors. There's also an introduction on predictive processing in this collection for anyone who um, who's interested in an introduction. So, um, this talk is about the following problem. Uh, what is the relation between probabilistic representations as posited by predictive processing and the apparently non-probabilistic contents of consciousness? And the solution will be that we have to be more specific about what we mean by probabilistic representations and by probabilistic contents. Because once we distinguish between different ways in which representations can be probabilistic, it's not at all obvious that the contents of, con of consciousness are non-probabilistic in these senses. So, in fact, I will distinguish four ways in which the brain can encode information probabilistically and six ways in which the contents of consciousness can be probabilistic. But the starting point, or a possible starting point for this um, debate is that we, we know what the contents of consciousness are. This is at least a, an assumption many people make, and we know that uh, neural information processing is probabilistic, and this seems to create a tension. But then again, there are people who say that there's no proposition about one's own or anybody else's conscious experience that is immune to error, unlikely as that error might be. And support for this comes from many interesting paradigms like change blindness or research on visual metamers or the Sperling task, which at least put pressure on intuitive assumptions about the contents of consciousness. And there's some debate about what exactly we experience in these cases. So we should probably be a lot more careful when we make claims about the contents of consciousness. And maybe we should also be more careful when we speak about neural information processing. But still, there seems to be some things that we do know. For instance, Andy in a forthcoming paper about the Bayesian blur says at least according to predictive processing, the brain is a probabilistic prediction machine. But daily human experience presents a determinate world in which things typically seem to be one way or another rather than appearing as a subtle distribution of probabilities. We experience a univocal way things are rather than a Bayesian blur of possibilities. Or as uh, Charles Fox puts it in his uh, dissertation, we know from our own perception of the world that we do perceive a unitary coherent percept rather than a Bayesian blur of possibilities. And so once we make this assumption, the following problem seems to arise, namely uh, um, if we know that intelligent behavior can be implemented using only probabilistic representations that always only represent different possibilities, why does the brain bother generating a unitary coherent percept. Or in other words, we, we know that the contents of consciousness are non-probabilistic. This seems to be one thing at least we know. And we know that at least according to predictive processing, neural information processing is probabilistic. And so this creates this tension between personal level descriptions of consciousness and subpersonal level description descriptions of um, neural information processing. And then the question is, how can we make sense of the non-probabilistic contents of consciousness in terms of probabilistic neural information processing? And uh, what I want to suggest here is that these statements are, in fact, ambiguous. So there are different ways in which information processing can be probabilistic and at least according to some ways of representing probabilities, it's not clear that the contents of consciousness are non-probabilistic in that sense. So, um, what does it mean to represent a probability distribution? Here's a nice recent paper by Pitko and Angelaki. 
So um, they say there are several competing models of how neural populations encode probabilities. And I think the important point here is that there are several competing models. So this points to a lack of knowledge we have about how the brain represents probabilities. And temporal representations of uncertainty, like the sampling hypothesis, instantaneous neural activity represents a single interpretation without uncertainty, and probabilities are reflected by the set of interpretations over time. And then there are spatial representations of probability. And according to these models, the spatial pattern of neural activity across a population of neurons implicitly encodes a probability distribution. So there the idea is that you have a population and different parts of the population represent different uh, possibilities at the same time and somehow assign a level of uncertainty or a probability to these possibilities. Maybe uh, reflected by the level of activation in these different parts of the population. Um, so again, one convenient classification of probabilistic representations is as spatial or temporal. And in spatial representations of uncertainty, such as probabilistic population codes, the spatial pattern of neural activity encodes a probability distribution. And in temporal representations of probabilities, the brain has only a point estimate of the latent variables at a single time. And uncertainty is defined by the variety of interpretations sampled across time. Uncertainty about the world is represented by temporal variability in neural responses. So there are at least these two general ways of um, encoding information probabilistically. And at least if uh, we focus on temporal probabilistic representations, it's not clear that the contents of consciousness are non-probabilistic in this sense. And in fact, we can make a further distinction because there are different ways of obtaining a point estimate. So let me just distinguish between uh, a maximum probability estimate and a random sample. So to illustrate, uh, think of a loaded die that yields the number six most of the times and the other numbers only occasionally. Then there are two ways you can obtain or generate a single estimate associated with that probability distribution. You can either take the um, option uh, that is most likely, which would be the six in this case, or you can, in effect, roll the die and obtain a ran random sample, which will, in most cases, also be a six, but it can also be one of the other numbers. And the thing is, you can uh, do this without uh, representing different possibilities and their associated probabilities um, uh, at, the, at the same time. So one way of obtaining random samples um, is uh, using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods in which you simulate a Markov chain, which is a certain stochastic process. And if it's a um, stationary Markov chain, it has the following interesting um, properties. So if you start the process in, a, in an arbitrary state and then let it run for a sufficient amount of time, you will not be able to predict the particular state it will be in at a given point in time. But there's a range of possible states that it can be in. And um, it will be in one of those states with certain probability. So in effect, when you uh, simulate such a process and then uh, after a certain amount of time um, observe the state the, the process is in, this can be regarded as a sample from the stationary distribution of this Markov chain. And you can also generate a maximum probability estimate without representing different possibilities along with their um, associated pro uh, probabilities. Uh, for instance, if you're interested in the mean of a normal distribution, you just uh, generate an estimate of the mean and then you can take repeated samples and uh, update your estimate of this mean without having to represent different uh, possibilities or different probabilities at any time. So, so much for temporal probabilistic representations and in fact you can also uh, make uh, a distinction among spatial probabilistic representations because the mere fact that at some point the brain uses uh, or may use spatial probabilistic representations doesn't mean that it doesn't use um, a, yeah, a reduced form or a de deterministic representation as well. So in fact if you have such a um, spatial probabilistic representation you can uh, apply a deterministic reduction and then just 
generate a single or um, uh, compute a single um, possibility from this um, uh, distribution, or you can have that without a deterministic reduction. So these are just four very general ways of um, describing probabilistic representations. And um, we don't know which or um, how many of these possibles are realized in the brain. It's an open question, and I call this the probability conundrum. It's uh, the, the problem that we don't know how probabilistic inference is implemented in the brain. But from a philosophical point of view, this is not, a, not such a, a big problem, we, because we can just um, consider different uh, possible ways in which the brain can encode probabilities and then um, hypothesize what this could tell us about the contents of consciousness. Because specific hypotheses about neural encoding of probabilistic information allow more specific hypotheses about the contents of consciousness. Or, in other words, we can ask, what would the contents of consciousness be like if they were probabilistic in certain ways? So this is similar to this uh, nice question by Michael Madari, how would the world look if it looked as, a, as if it were encoded as an intertwined set of probability distributions? And in fact, I think we can distinguish between um, six options. So we'll go through them one by one and what follows. And um, not all of these options will qualify as intuitively probabilistic, but this is exactly the point because uh, not all ways of representing information probabilistically qualify as intuitively probabilistic. The first option is what I guess most people think of when they say that consciousness is probabilistic or that it's non-probabilistic. This is a probabilistic blur. Two or more different mutually inconsistent possibilities are experienced at the same time. Now, are there any examples of this? Um, one could point maybe to illusions like the waterfall illusion in which some part of space seems to be moving but at the same time seems to be stationary or maybe Paul Churchland's impossible color sensations are an example in which you uh, have for instance um, an experience as of a dark blue that is darker than any blue you've ever seen but yet not black. But I guess to, this, to these examples one could object that even if they present us with different inconsistent possibilities, there are no uncertainties associated with these possibilities or no probabilities. So maybe a better example would be what John Morrison calls perceptual confidence. And this is the idea that uh, conscious experiences assign different degrees of confidence to different possibilities. So when our experiences assign less than full confidence, they assign confidence to at least one other possibility. In simple cases, our experiences assign confidence to a possibility and its negation, like that the light is on and that the light is off. Um, I'm actually not sure whether there there's more than one person who believes this. So I'm, I'm really curious, um, um, how many of you find this plausible that conscious experience or perceptual experience assigns degrees of confidence to different possibilities? Could you please raise your hand if you find this plausible? Okay, good. Um, and now we can ask, to what extent is this compatible or supported by different ways of encoding information probabilistically. It's obviously supported by spatial probabilistic representations without deterministic reduction, because then you have representations of different possibilities. It doesn't mean that it conclusively shows that this is the case, but at least it's uh, to some extent supported by this. If, if there's a, the brain, in fact, uh, represents probabilities in this spatial sense. It's, had, uh, it's less supported 
if there's an additional deterministic reduction because then one could say, well, maybe this final deterministic representation is what determines the contents of consciousness and not the spatial probabilistic representation. And it's not consistent with temporal probabilistic representations because then uh, you never represent different possibilities in the first place. So the second option is uh, maximum probability. You know this from Jakob Hovi, the contents of consciousness correspond to a maximum probability estimate. On his words, conscious perception is determined by the prediction or hypothesis with the highest overall posterior probability. This is uh, supported by temporal probabilistic representations with a maximum probability estimate. It's not supported if uh, there's a random sample because it's then, then it's not necessarily the one with the highest overall probability. And uh, it's compatible with spatial probabilistic representations in which you then have a deterministic reduction and it's less supported by spatial probabilistic representations without deterministic reduction. Then there's a further option that is a bit similar to this. Um, contents of consciousness correspond to samples drawn from an internally represented probability distribution. So this has recently been suggested by a Gross and Flombaum. They say a natural thought is to associate phenomenology not directly with the memory store containing probabilistic representations, but with the discrete representations sampled therefrom. So their idea is that maybe at some point there's a spatial probabilistic representations of different possibilities, and then what is consciously experienced is a random sample from this distribution. Now, in principle, it's also compatible with uh, certain temporal probabilistic representations. And of course, it's uh, um, especially supported by spatial probabilistic representations with a deterministic reduction, and it's less supported by spatial probabilistic representations without determin deterministic reduction. Um, then there's a more specific form of sampling um, and it's the following, whether or not information is consciously experienced can be conceived as a probabilistic choice. So in the previous uh, form of sampling, the idea is that how things are experienced depends on a sample that is drawn from a distribution. And here the idea is that whether or not something is experienced depends on something like the throw of a, of a coin. So this has been... Um, suggested by Asplund and colleagues in the context of the attentional blink task. They say conscious perception emerges in a quantal manner with attention serving to modulate the probability that representations reach awareness. So I guess the idea is that um, whether or not something is experienced uh, is, uh, yeah, de depends on something like the throw of a coin and then you can um, bias this coin by assigning attention to, let's say, certain parts of the visual field, which uh, raises the probability that something that is there is then actually consciously experienced. Um, so this wouldn't be compatible with the maximum probability estimate version of the temporal probabilistic representation option. Uh, it's compatible with the random sample version. It's also compatible with the deterministic reduction version of the spatial probabilistic representation uh, option, and it's less supported by um, spatial probabilistic representations without deterministic reduction. Um, then there's a fifth possibility, counterfactuals. Um, when we consciously, consciously perceive an object, we not only experience its perspectival properties, but also counterfactual properties. So the example would be, the classic example would be the tomato. We not only perceive the surface of the tomato, but somehow also its object hood. And one way to cash this out is um, in terms of uh, the contents of counterfactual generative models that represent how um, sensory signals would change if certain movements or certain behaviors were uh, implemented. And if I 
um, for instance, were to change my visceral perspective on the tomato in certain ways. Now, uh, I'm not sure how to evaluate this proposal because it's, I think it's not clear how ex explicitly these counterfactual possibilities have to be represented. Or maybe Anil can give us an update on counterfactual models in the discussion. And maybe Carl will also say something about that in his talk. Okay, so um, let's come to the final option, indeterminacy. Um, here the idea is that perceptual experiences can have different degrees of determinacy. And this uh, has been proposed by Michael Madari, but also by Ben Snane. And his claim is that nothing in the bidirectional hierarchical models of brain function uh, functions implies the perceptual, the perceptual representations are probabilistic. He says there's a much more parsimonious way of describing the representations in the bidirectional hierarchical model of brain functions. They attribute properties to objects or to the perceived scene that are not fully determinate. So I guess when he says um, that the representations are not probabilistic, I think what he has in mind is this uh, spatial notion of probabilistic representations in which different possibilities are represented and um, he suggests that um, instead uh, the, the contents are um, properties that um, are not fully determinate. So this would be compatible with uh, temporal probabilistic representations. It um, would also be compatible with uh, spatial probabilistic representations with deterministic reduction and it's less supported by spatial probabilistic representations without deterministic reduction. So we can summarize this in a table here on the left are the different options regarding the contents of consciousness or so the different ways in which consciousness can be probabilistic or in which the generation of consciousness can be probabilistic and here are the four ways of representing information probabilistically that I've distinguished and we get the following picture and um, so what we see here that is that there's only one option according to which the or, or which directly supports the probabilistic blur um, um, option so in fact if most or all um, representations in the brain are at are only probabilistic in one of these other senses, then this threat of the Bayesian blur doesn't, um, uh, doesn't appear in the first place. And um, on the other hand, if there are only spatial probabilistic representations without deterministic reduction, this puts a lot of pressure on these other options regarding the contents of consciousness. Now, um, this, I, I think, already looks kind of complicated and things are, I guess, even more complicated because it's not clear which of these options is uh, implemented in the brain and maybe all of them are um, to, um, in, in, in different areas. So I think there are a lot of um, open questions. And this is, um, in, in fact, one of the, the take-home messages that there are so many open questions and um, but at least assumptions about the format of probabilistic neural representations put constraints on descriptions of conscious contents. And so that more specific hypotheses about the brain's way of encoding information support more specific hypotheses about the contents of consciousness. And the hope is that if we gain more evidence about how the brain represents probabilistic information or information probabilistically, then this will also tell us more about the contents of consciousness. Thank you for your attention.